serve a great God. Let's sing. The splendor of the King clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light and dark. 
Good morning, brothers and sisters. These are interesting times we're living in. Unusual times can be kind of difficult to know just exactly what to do. But that's okay. That's nothing strange. I've lived most of my life not knowing exactly what I ought to do. <laughs> Haven't you? I mean, really, when do we really know exactly what to do? But we do know this, that the Lord is leading us. As I uh, surveyed the congregation this morning, it reminded me of a time when all the disciples had was just a command. Wait. Jesus said, wait. And there were just 120 of them in the upper room. Gathered in a room, something like this, 120 of them. And he said, wait. And I'm going to do something great. And what you're supposed to do is wait. And just a few days later, Jesus poured out the Spirit of God on the day of Pentecost, and a great revival happened. It's kind of like these days. It's kind of like these days. We're all waiting, right? When is this going to end? When are things going to... Well, who knows? I don't know. Jesus did not say, wait this many days, this many hours, and this is when you can expect me to do something. He just said, pray and wait, and we're here praying, and we're here waiting, and we're here expecting. Uh, God is going to do great, great things. I expect Him to do great things this morning. God's people are gathered together, as He told us to do. We're here praying, we're here singing, we're going to preach His Word, and it's good to be here we're glad for those folks who are able to join us online as they're waiting in their living rooms and bedrooms and kitchens and dining rooms and everywhere else. Uh, it is, it is, this is the day the Lord has made, and we're going to rejoice, and we're going to be glad in it. It's been so good to hear your voices singing already. So, I don't know. If you don't feel comfortable doing that this morning, that's all right. But if you do, if you're close enough to somebody that you can grab a hold of their hand, and pray the Lord's Prayer. I see you looking at each other kind of funny. That's all right. That's all right. Take hold of somebody's hand. And let's pray together in faith, and waiting and hoping and expecting God to do great things. Can you pray with me? Lord, we're thankful. We woke up this morning. We breathe the good air you provided for us. Every breath is a gift from you. Every breath that fills our lungs and brings life to us. And we've come to your house, your people. And your people are gathered here and there, literally all over the globe right now, worshiping together. Some are even alone, but we know, Lord, that you are with them and we are with them in spirit, just like the Apostle Paul 
writing to his churches, said he may be absent from them in body, but we, he's with them in spirit. And we are with them. And I pray, Lord, that if there's somebody out there this morning who feels alone, Lord, I pray that you'd remind them that they have not been forgotten, that they have not been abandoned, that we are never alone, that your presence is with us always. We're thankful to be in your house. We know there's a lot of people who are really struggling hard. They're having bad times, who are struggling physically, who are struggling financially, who are struggling in their family relationships, with their job, all kinds of things. But you are able to do all things, and you promised to work all things together for our good, for those who love you, who are called according to your purpose. And we hold on to this promise, and we know that your word is always true. And we love you this morning. We're thankful for your son, who taught us to pray to our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Psalm 107. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Verse 23. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wits' end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they had quiet. And he brought them to their desired haven. 
Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to the sons of men. Verse 43. Whoever is wise, let him give heed to these things. Let men consider the steadfast love of the Lord. We're going to let the kids head back to Children's Church at this time. I saw a few fist bumps there. Yes. I'm pressing on the upward way through new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up.
Thank you, Amanda. It's great. Turn to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14. For about the last two and a half years, we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew with a small interruption for the last two years. So we're back in it today. And I think this is a good passage for these days. The title is The Son of God Strolls on the Sea. Matthew 14. 22 through 33. I hope you can see your life in this text because Jesus' disciples are supposed to, to see ourselves right in the middle of it. The Bible says, Then Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was many furlongs distant from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, came to them walking on the sea. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful to have your word open before us and to have the promise of your Son, who is the word, became flesh, who said that he will send his spirit to lead us into all truth. And so we have your word open before us. We have your spirit who lives within us. Not only within us individually, but who lives among your people, your congregation as we gather together. And we are looking to you, our Father, to speak to us through your word, through your Son, and through your spirit. To reveal yourself to us and to transform us into the image of your Son. And so we pray that you would do these things according to your word and that you would help me, help me to do my best for your glory and for the good of your people and your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. The passage starts with then. Jesus had just fed the 5,000 men in addition to women and children just fed the multitudes with a little bit of fish, a little bit of bread. And it says immediately he ordered them to get into the boat. It would be interesting to see how your different translations render that. He ordered them to get into the boat and to start across the sea ahead of him. Now we don't know why Jesus made them get into the boat. It's an unusual word for this passage. It's a strong word. An authoritative command, something like, get in the boat, head out, now, go. The Gospel of John, in this uh, narrative outlay as the one story, the feeding of the 5,000, leads into the next story. It's the same progression. The people had tried to make him king. And so it was clear why they needed to get out of there. Okay, But here, it's it's not so clear. Maybe we're supposed to... Read between the lines here. Maybe Matthew wants us to imagine the same sort of thing or to understand from another context. Could there have been some other reason why Jesus says to them, all right, get out of here, get in the boat and go on? Or why they may have needed a bit of a shove to get into the boat and head across the lake? Did these seasoned fishermen know? Or the, the breezes begin to blow. We know there's a storm coming. We know that there's a windstorm coming. We've, we've been here before. We've been on the sea all of our lives, we know. And maybe Jesus had to say, no, go on anyway. Now, we don't know. But Matthew says that Jesus commanded them, get in the boat, head across. So they went down to the boat and started across the sea to the other side at the command of Jesus. 
after they left, says that Jesus sent the crowds away. The disciples went down into the boat. Jesus sends the crowds away. And it says Jesus goes up, up into the hills alone to pray. So everyone goes in different directions. The disciples go down into the boat, into the sea. The crowds are sent away, and Jesus goes up into the hills. Everyone scatters different directions. Finally, Jesus has some time alone. If you look back in verse 13, it says that he had originally gone away to this place to be alone. When the crowds followed him, found him, and he healed them, blessed them, fed them. But now he's alone on a mountain, praying to his father. He's gone away and finally found some alone time to pray. This is so critical for life, the life of faith. We must eventually get away and pray to the Father. We may have to command some folks, look, I've got to get out of here. If we don't, life will continue to press upon us. There will always be a reason not to go away and pray. Life will crowd out prayers. Maybe I was thinking it's like Matthew chapter 5. You know, Jesus says, uh, if your eye offends you, pluck it out and throw it away. If your hand offends you, chop it off and throw it away. In other, in other words, deal ruthlessly with things for the sake of your spiritual life. Sometimes we have to draw a line in the sand and say, look, I have got to get away and pray. Go on. Maybe that's what it had to do with. Well, he says he must have prayed a long time because when evening came, it says he began praying, and he was up there praying into the middle of the night. 3 a.m. is when our story picks up. That's a long time to pray. From sunset to 3 a.m., all that time Jesus was praying, the disciples were fighting the weather. They were out in the middle of the sea, a long, long way from land. Matthew emphasizes that. They weren't close to the land. It wasn't that when Jesus walks in the sea, they actually were so dark they didn't know he was walking in the water close. No, he says he was, they were out in the middle of the sea, a long way from land, and there was a winter windstorm. These same windstorms happen today. They come sweeping down from the east, from the Goan Heights, east of the Sea of Galilee, down onto the sea. These kinds of storms are windstorms. It's not a thunderstorm. We should not imagine thunder crashing, lightning, rain. All. It's not that kind of a storm. It is a windstorm that stirs up the sea, sends waves tossing to and fro. The Bible says here that the boat was actually, it's another interesting word, the boat was being tormented by the waves. It says the wind was against them. Now we need to be careful here because we could get this event confused with that other story. When Jesus, do you remember when Jesus was sleeping in the boat and the disciples thought that they were going to die and they cry out, Lord, save us, don't you care that we're going to drown, that we're going to die? No, this is not that story. The disciples are not in any danger. They are struggling to get across the sea. But this was not something strange. No doubt they had faced this kind of windstorm on the sea before. It's just slow going. They're worn smooth out. They've been struggling hard for every yard. And it was already 3 a.m. These fishermen, kind of like farmers, they were probably used to getting up when the sun came up. Around 6 a.m. when the sun comes up. And here it was. 3 a.m. Have you ever had uh, trouble sleeping? You toss and turn, and you, you look at the clock, and maybe you count. If I could go to sleep right now, I could get three hours of sleep. I could get four. If I could just go to sleep right now, and you fight so hard to get to sleep, and you get discouraged because you know the alarm clock is going off in three hours. It's going off in four hours. I'm not going to be able to get very much sleep. They should have been, been in bed snoozing for hours already. Here they are, 3 o'clock in the morning, still in the boat, fighting for every inch. Because Jesus sent them out onto this turbulent sea, a windstorm on the sea. And it's an important lesson. There's no need to fear or think something has gone wrong when the command of Jesus has landed us in danger all around us. You may think, well, the reason you're in this situation is because you disobeyed. No, not at all. The reason they were in this situation, Jesus commanded them. Now is the time to go out right now. And so when we find ourselves in difficult circumstances, we may be exactly where we're supposed to be. We shouldn't automatically jump to, what have I done wrong to deserve this? 
Well, if they were exhausted, they're about to get a jolt of energy. I wonder if one of them sort of squinted into the dark. What the heck is going on here? Maybe said to himself, do, do, what is that? Do you see something out there on top of the water? Uh, yeah, I do. Seems to be getting closer. Do you see that? Guys, what? Whatever it is, it's coming right at us. And they all came to the conclusion, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear, it's a ghost walking on the water. Walking on the water. It has to be a ghost. What else could it possibly be? They couldn't have known it was Jesus. They didn't expect Jesus to be walking, strolling around on the water. This was not something he did every day. Out in the middle of the deep blue sea, strolling up on the waves and in the wind. It must be a ghost. Now let's stop right there. Says Jesus was walking on the water. Here in just a moment, it's going to say Peter was walking on the water. Now listen, this is the year 2022. Since this story was written down by some Jewish peasants, just regular folks from the ancient Near East 2,000 years ago, since this was written down, we know what has happened. Copernicus, Galileo, Newton, Darwin, Mendel, Einstein, Hubble, Watson, and Crick. You see where I'm going with this? All of these things, we, underline this, now know. Have you ever heard this lately? We now know. We now know. Anyone heard of the Enlightenment? Anyone heard about the scientific revolution? I know there are a lot of folks who say, we now know. It is impossible for anyone to walk on the water. We now know. No. Have you ever seen anyone walk on the water? I sure haven't. I haven't. Nobody I know has ever seen anybody walk on the water. Therefore, what? Therefore, no one can walk. If I've never seen it, you've never seen it, we now know. I want to warn you this morning to watch out for we now know. The first century fishermen also knew People don't walk on water. They did not say, oh, clearly it's Jesus coming to us on the sea. No, they said, well, what you can't be a human being, it must be a ghost. That's why they say, it's a ghost. We now know. When you hear that, I want you to think carefully about who is the we. Who is the we? That guy over here in the white lab coat. Who is he? He's never seen it. He's got this mathematical formula about gravity and buoyancy and all this kind of things. It says it is impossible. All of his buddies in their white coats said they never saw it, and they have math formulas too, and that's just the way it is. We now know. Is their knowledge so vast and so exhaustive? That they have figured out all the mysteries of the universe and they know everything. Is their wisdom so profound and so deep? The truth is, they even tell us. They don't even know most of what is in the sea. They don't even know what's down there. They don't know what's holding it all. How could they possibly know what's possible? God's word says it happened. Therefore, it happened. And finally, we're going to have to come to that point. Say, we got to start, everyone has to start somewhere. Everybody starts somewhere. You can either start with the experience of humanity with their own one worldview, their accidentally evolved pea brains that have figured everything out. You can start with the experience of man and his reasoning, or you can start with God's word. It is perfectly reasonable and justifiable to start with God's Word. If you start where God's Word starts, in the beginning, God created everything. Then it's not difficult at all to believe this story. I want you to think about this for just a moment. We are already, all the time, surrounded by the most profound miracles. If we only had eyes to see. Look, the world has been created. Just go outside, look around. There are miracles everywhere. There are birds flying to and fro. Right now, I am communicating with you. And you are understanding, I hope, what I am saying. Because I am producing disturbances 
in the air with my lungs, my diaphragm, my vocal cords, my lips, my teeth, my mouth, my gums, and it is disturbing the air. Now think about this. There are sound waves that are going out to you that are landing upon these little ears that you have that are disturbing an eardrum and three little bones down there in your ear connected to a nerve that sends a neural impulse into your brain and you are understanding what I am saying. This impulse in my own brain has somehow made it into your brain by way of the air and vibrations. Now that is a miracle. If you can believe little things like that, this is not difficult at all to believe. We're surrounded by miracles. The world has already been created. That there is a sea and that there are people to talk about it and to understand one another is a greater miracle already than if one of these people were to walk on the sea. That's what I think about it anyway. That's what God's Word says. How do we know Jesus and Peter walked on the water? Well, look right here in the Word of God. It says so right here in the authoritative, infallible Word of God. So I believe it. Well, the disciples knew something was moving on the water. They reasonably deduced it must be a ghost. Until what changed their mind in the story? What changed their mind? They heard a voice. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Underline those words in your copy of God's Word. Those are some of the greatest words you will ever hear. Take courage. Don't be afraid. And right in the middle, it is I. It is I. Notice here, the wind kept blowing. The waves kept crashing. But when they heard his voice, their fear died down. Not the winds and the waves, but their fear died down when they heard his voice. Jesus says in John chapter 10, the sheep, my sheep, hear my voice. And they know me. And they're not afraid. His voice made all the difference. It is I. Not their sight, but hearing. His voice. I do not see him today, but I hear him. Notice Jesus does not say, it is Jesus. He says, it is I. Well, what difference does that make? Well, it makes a big difference. We'll see why here in just a minute. Take courage, Jesus said. Peter took, just as Peter does with all things, Peter took, take courage to the next level. Hey, he said, take courage. I'm going to take some courage. He quickly gets over his fear and he cries out to Jesus. Underline this. If it is you, call me to come out and walk on the sea with you. Call to me to come to walk on the water with you. Jesus says, come on. I want you to notice that Peter didn't just jump in. He Listen to me. He waited for the word. It was not presumption. Jesus is walking on the water. I'm just going to dive in. He waited for for the word, call me to come out. When I know it's you, when I hear it's your voice, and you give me the green light, then I'll come out. It was Peter's initiative. Call me to come out. But it was not Peter's presumption. We should not say, well, I have enough faith. Seems right to me. I'm just going to do it. Oh, he consulted Jesus. He called out to Jesus, and Jesus said, come on. Notice Peter's reasoning. First, Lord, you are able to walk on the water. Second, therefore, Lord, you are able to make me walk on the water. This is always the pattern, beloved children of God. It's always the pattern. Jesus first, we follow. Jesus first, we follow. That's always the pattern. Jesus first, then we follow when we hear his voice. This goes for the entire Christian life. He said to the disciples, follow me. How far? All the way to the cross? Take up your cross and follow me. All the way to resurrection. This is the way Paul reasons. If Peter could walk on the sea because Jesus walked on the sea, then because Jesus has been raised from the dead, we will also follow him in this. This is what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15. 
But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, each in its turn. What is, what is the order? First, Christ, the first fruits. Then, when he comes, those who belong to him. Just as Jesus was raised, so we will also be raised, just as Jesus walked on the water and Peter was able to. Hebrews 12 says, Jesus is the pioneer of our faith. He goes before us. He is also the perfecter of our faith. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Peter had his eyes on Jesus. The pioneer, you've gone before me, and the perfecter of our faith. The one who began a good work in you is going to complete the work that he started. Because he's the pioneer, he goes before us, and he's the perfecter. He's the one who finishes it. So Peter said, call to me to come out on the water. No, he says, call to me to come to you. I think of little children when they learn to walk. How do they learn to walk? Most of the time, they don't learn to walk just by sort of deciding, I'm over here on the cow, I want to stand up and just sort of wander around the house. It's almost always mom and dad get in front of the child. Maybe mom stands the little girl up and dad says, come on, come on, come to daddy, come to mama. And the little child begins to do what I call the Frankenstein walk. They all begin the Frankenstein walk. And the child begins to come, keeping her eyes on her daddy, keeping her eyes on her mother. And this is the way it always is, keeping his eyes. Let me come to you. Let me come to you. And that is the key in the book of Hebrews, keeping, fixing our eyes on Jesus. And this is what Peter does at the beginning. Jesus says, Come on. But there's wind and wave and water and everything else. The Bible says it wasn't the water that mattered. It wasn't the wind that mattered. It wasn't the waves that mattered. It was the word that mattered. And that's all that mattered. That's all. Jesus said it. All right. It doesn't matter what the obstacles are. I have the word from Jesus. And here he goes. Peter gets down out of the boat and starts walking in the wind, on top of the water, and on the crashing waves. This is a man just like you and me. Notice what the text says. So Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid again. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, O oh man, O oh ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Important, important point God's word is making here. In our walk of faith, the faith that got you out of the boat is not enough to keep you afloat. You ever had a good beginning? <laughs> And then I get out in the middle of it. Oh, this is not what I expected. Huh? Started out good. Plenty of faith, excitement, confidence. Yes, I've obeyed the Lord. I'm in this new place, this new journey. Oh, man, this is not what I expected. The waves didn't die down when Peter began walking on the water. Jesus did not calm the sea so Peter could walk on a calm sea. Maybe he remembered his name. He called me rock. I'm about to sink. Chaos all around. He begins to sink. He had been afraid of the ghost in the boat. Now he's afraid again. This time he sees the wind and the waves and the rock begins to sink. And he cries out, Lord, save me. He's echoing Psalm 69. Rescue me from the mire. Do not let me sink. Deliver me from those who hate me from the deep waters. Do not let the flood waters engulf me, or the depths swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. This is the life of faith. 
for every one of us. Euphoria. I remember answering the call to preach. Wow, I'm going to go change the world and stepping out in faith and going to Bible college and announcing to everybody. Have you ever experienced this? I've had this experience. I've made a decision. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. And it's wonderful. Maybe you come down to the altar and you cry tears of joy. You go under the water in baptism and everything is wonderful. It begins in euphoria. This is the way it always begins. And then moves from that to fear. Sometimes fast. Begin by walking on the water. Don't think that something strange, if you have found yourself sinking after being so confident at the beginning. It's not strange. This is a life of faith. This is the life of discipleship. When you step out of the place of safety onto the sea, and you're walking up straight and tall, even when you're walking on the sea, there is still chaos under your feet. It has not disappeared. There's still waves under your feet. Sometimes the waves can reach up and grab you. And they do. Thankfully, when your faith falters and the chaos reaches up and begins to pull you back down, there's someone there still to reach down and pull you back up. This has been an exciting story already. Jesus walking on the fighting the wind and the waves, Jesus walking on the water, Peter walking on the water. But I want you to notice, this is the climactic moment of this story. The climax of this story comes now. Here it is, when Jesus reaches down and pulls sinking Peter back up. I want you to notice that Jesus saves Peter even when his faith faltered. Jesus saves us, even when our faith falters. Finally, my hope is not in my ability to believe good enough. Finally, my hope is not in my ability to hold on to my faith. It's not that my faith is holding on to me. It's that Jesus is the one who is holding on to me, even when my faith falters, because that is who Jesus is. He is the Savior. He didn't come to abandon those whose faith is failing and they're falling deeper into the surging sea. He came exactly to save those kind of people. I'm going to pull you back up. (laughs) That's, That's all of our experience. Something strange has not happened to you. This is the life of faith. And they have, notice, a conversation on the sea, right there on the water. It doesn't say they went back into the boat and had a conversation. Right there on the sea. Jesus says, oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Peter doubted, and he was still rescued. I like that. I like that. There's hope for me. I don't don't think Jesus said this to Peter scowling. Sometimes we can imagine, oh, you of little faith, you disgust me. Why did you doubt? I don't think it was like that at all. I don't think it was like that at all. I think he probably said it smiling. Oh, you have little faith. (laughs) You didn't need to doubt. It's unnecessary. Come on. Notice he did not say, oh, ye of no faith. He didn't say, oh, faithless one. He said, oh, ye of little faith. He didn't say, well, after this, you would have been better off just staying in the boat if you're going to act like this. No, 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 none of that kind of thing. Why did you doubt? What's Peter's answer? Did you notice in your text? No answer. (laughs) No answer. I don't know. What answer could he give? I don't know. Has Jesus ever asked you this? Why did you doubt? Actually, someone does ask me that sometimes. Me. After I've got back into the boat safely, I ask myself, why did I doubt? He's always been so faithful to me. Lord, why did I doubt? You know what my answer always is? I don't know. Why did I doubt again? Why did I fall again? Why did I fail again? I don't know. In all these years and all this learning and all this education, I haven't come up with a better answer than that. I don't know. Makes no sense to me. I did it again. He picked me up again. This is not strange. Father Abraham... Come out of your homeland to a place where I will show you. 
All right. What happens? The first thing that happens when he gets to the promised land, there's a famine. You can see the wind and the waves below his feet. And he bolts to Egypt and lies about his wife. The children of Israel brought through the sea. They come to the other side. God has saved them. <clears throat> and they sing a song of salvation. The very next thing that happens is that they go out into the wilderness and they face a test and they fail. They begin to complain. Where's the water? Where's the food? Things are better back in Egypt. There's a pattern here. A big step of faith and then a big failure. And God lifts them back up. I want you to notice that only Peter stepped out. <clears throat> Where's the rest of them? Where's the rest of the bunch? Well, that's a picture of the entire Christian life of discipleship. We were all <clears throat> going to take a step out, walk a while in faith. We're all going to do this and then fall down. I think the Bible is teaching us better to step out and sink down than to sit in the boat and watch. It's easy to criticize that person who took a great step of faith, <clears throat> excuse me, and then begins to sink and stay in the boat. But notice they did not criticize them. Walking with Jesus should not be boring. What is the Christian life like? It is supposed to be stepping out in faith, knowing my faith may fail. If your Christian life is boring, you're doing it wrong. You're not doing it right. He's calling you to step out in faith. Get out of the boat. <clears throat> if you can only take one step before you sink, it's better than staying in the boat. He will rescue you. Now when they get into the boat, the wind dies down. Just like that. But not until they get into the boat. Caleb just read a moment ago Psalm 107. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm. And he guided them to their desired haven. Yeah, that's good. I'll give you a break, all right? Round two. <clears throat> get into the boat then the sea is still after they're all back in the boat what happens when they get back in the boat this reminds us of the story of Jonah there was a great storm on the sea because of Jonah's disobedience they throw him in and the Bible says they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. And then what? When the pagan sailors see the raging sea grow calm, at this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Why? Because they knew that God Almighty had calmed the sea. <clears throat> Notice the pattern. He stills the sea and they worship. Two things happen when they get back in the boat. The climactic moment <clears throat> was saving a doubter. He lifts him up who was sinking down in doubt. But the central claim of this passage is that Jesus is the Son of God. Only two times in the Gospel of Matthew does it say truly you are the Son of God. Only two times do the disciples bow down and worship Him. Matthew 27, Jesus is hanging on the cross when the centurion and those with Him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake. There had been an earthquake on the sea earlier, now there's an earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. And then Matthew 28, <clears throat> after the resurrection, 
They see Jesus. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Isn't that amazing? This is the resurrected Jesus out of the tomb, appeared to them. This is how doubt can grab a hold of us and linger and still be a thorn in our flesh throughout our journey. It's okay. It's nothing strange that has happened to you. When they got back in the boat, nobody praised Peter. <clears throat> nobody said, Peter, way to go. That was amazing. We saw the way you walked. No, no, no. They worshiped and confessed Jesus. There's no attention on Peter when they get back in the boat. They didn't praise Peter. They worshiped and confessed Jesus. They also didn't criticize Peter. Did you guys see how he sunk down there at the end and cried out like a baby? Wow, I'm glad I'm not. They didn't do that. The focus is all on Jesus. If you like this kind of thing, here's a little list of the disciples' experience in this passage. They sail. <clears throat> they struggle. They see. They shake. They shout. Peter steps out. He sinks down. He is saved. They bow down and confess. This is an unusual miracle. Why? This is not the kind of thing Jesus normally does. What was the purpose of this miracle? Is Jesus helping anybody? It's not that Peter was out in the sea sinking down and Jesus jumped out of the boat and raised him. It wasn't like that. Does he heal anybody? No. Feeding? No. Restoring? No. He's walking on the sea, but why? To rescue the disciples? No. They're not in any danger. Having a hard time getting across the sea, but they're not. The boat is not sinking. This is not an unusual thing for a bunch of fishermen. So why? Why this miracle? A parable is a spoken miracle. And a miracle is an enacted parable. Their point, <clears throat> point of a miracle, is not even what is done, but it is what it communicates about Jesus and the kingdom of God. It is a revelation. That's the function of a parable and a miracle. This moment is like his baptism. Jesus comes out of the water. This is my beloved son. It's like the transfiguration. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. This walking on the sea is a moment of revelation. Jesus walked on the sea. On the sea. What do you think about the sea when I say the sea? I know right now Jenny has visions. She can smell the beautiful gulf there on the shores of Galveston. Beauty, the waves and the seagulls. And it's so beautiful and so wonderful. And we all love to go to the sea. We go on vacations to the sea to relax the tranquility, the recreation. We go on cruise ships. We purposefully go out in the middle of the sea. The sea, for us, is the connotation of something beautiful and something that brings tranquility and calm. Each time I go on a cruise, I go out at night, stand on the edge and look over the edge dark and deep sea and I always wonder think if I fell in to the deep dark sea I'd be doomed to die I'd have no hope this is what Jesus is strolling on and for the people in that world the sea was an abyss of mystery what is out there we don't know it's where people go to die, what's down there in the murky deep, a place where boats go to disappear forever. It's the place of chaos, the story of Jonah. The sea is an enemy. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, how it describes it. The earth was formless and empty, just a great big sea, and that's all there was. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering. It's a place of darkness and a place of danger. That's why in the flood... The earth returns to its original chaotic state, deep darkness and danger. This is the way the people in the ancient Near East thought about the sea. Jesus is walking on this chaos. The children of Israel go through 
the chaotic sea piled up on both sides, and then it comes crashing down and kills everybody and drowns all of the Egyptians. This is the way they thought about the sea, the darkness and the deep and the danger and the chaos. And this is what Jesus is walking upon. That's the point of this passage. That's why in Revelation chapter, five, chapter 4, it describes before the throne of God in this age. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Why does it describe it like that? There was not a disturbance. The sea before the throne of God has been completely tamed. We are living in a time of chaos, and it feels like all of us are out on a sea that is windy and wavy and tossing us to and fro, and Jesus comes to us walking upon the sea. At the end of all things, Revelation 21, 1, the Bible says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and notice, there was no longer any sea. Jesus comes to us into a chaotic world, walking on the sea and says, you can come walk with me on the sea. And Jesus walks upon the sea until all of the chaos is tamed, until there finally is no more sea. And it's only peace and life. No more chaos and confusion. Job 9, 8, God alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. Who can do this? Who can do this? Only God alone. And this is the central claim of this passage, and I'm done. Notice when Jesus comes to them, he does not say, it's Jesus. He says, ego eni. It is I. This is what Moses heard at the burning bush. Who shall I say is sending you? I am. Each time Jesus in the New Testament says, it is I, this is an echo of the Old Testament God, the one God who is from the beginning to the end. Jesus is saying, I am God, it is I. Then Peter says, if it is you, a su, a. And then the last thing that is said, truly, you are the Son of God. Would you bow your heads with me? Have you come to believe today that Jesus truly is the Son of God who rescues not only you but the whole world from chaos and confusion? Have you made that confession today? Jesus, you truly are the Son of God and I will follow you on stormy seas of chaos knowing that sometimes I will fall and fail, but I know that you are going to lift me up and take me all the way home. Marion is going to play as your heads are bowed and eyes are closed. We'll give you a few moments to reflect and to pray. Maybe it feels right now that you are sinking down in a chaotic sea. Maybe you've taken a step of faith, but it looks like everything is falling apart. What am I doing out here? How did I get out here? Why didn't I stay on safe ground? Jesus is saying, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It is I. I'm not going to let you sink. I'm not going to let you fail. I'm not going to let you fall. I began a good work in you, and I'm going to finish it. I'm the pioneer and the perfecter of your faith. Is there someone here today who has never turned to Jesus in faith and repentance? who has never heard that voice and stepped out for that first time, the step of faith and said, I will follow you? Have you confessed Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, who died for the sins of the world, who has risen, who has defeated death, sin, hell, the devil, and all powers of chaos that threaten the world, and who is making all things new until finally there is no more sea? Won't that be a great day? Is there someone here today who needs to turn to Him as Savior and as Lord? As Marion plays, allow the Spirit of God, open your heart in humility and meekness and allow the Spirit of God to do His powerful work in your life.
our Father in heaven, we're thankful that your word tells us that you love the world so much that you sent your only begotten Son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Father in heaven, thank you for sending us so great a Savior who has saved us with so great a salvation. Thank you that he is our pioneer, that he goes before us in all things, that he is the perfecter, that he is going to bring us home safely. And we know that in between the start and the end, there will be times when our faith fails. But we're thankful for the faithfulness of your son who lifts us back up who sets us on the solid ground. Lord, bless your people as we go from this place. Father, help us to be ready and willing to step out in faith to all the places to which we're being called for your glory and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. You have your bulletins there. Brother Bailey is not here with us today. Uh, <clears throat> there's an announcement at the bottom of the first page about Financial Peace University, and I believe we have a video that is queued up here. Uh, it will begin, supposed to begin February the 16th, 2022. We've had these before, and they've been really, really good. Gary and Cassie are going to lead this, so have a little commercial for you here before we go. Hey guys, Rachel Cruz here. Can you imagine having no debt? That means no car payments, no student loans, no credit card bills, no payments. Hard to imagine, isn't it? We live in a culture where debt is considered normal. 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. That means eight out of 10 people heard the same thing you did. You can't survive without debt. Everyone knows that, except it probably sounded more like, you can't live without a car payment. You have to have a credit card. You can't go to college without student loans. So what'd you do? Well, you got a loan for your car. You have not just one, not two, but three credit cards, and you'll be paying for college into retirement. And now, before you know it, debt starts to weigh you down. You see, Proverbs 22, seven is true. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. When you owe someone else your paycheck, the money comes in and goes right back out and you don't have anything left to pay yourself or to bless others. And this isn't the life God wants for you, but we have a step-by-step -step plan that can help. It's called Financial Peace University and it has helped over 5 million people learn God's ways of handling money. And you can get out of debt, save, invest, and make giving a part of your daily life. And with Financial Peace University, you can start today. Hey guys, Rachel Cruz here. Can you imagine having no... In case you missed it the first time, would you stand and receive the Lord's blessing? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine down upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. There it is, Mitch.